wish you guys would shout more. No, I wish you would shout about the exciting things that God has done for you. I want you to live in the excitement. God wants you to live in the excitement. He wants you to live in the joy. That's another word for excitement. He wants to live you in the thanksgiving. That's another word for excitement. He wants you to live in the praise. That's another word for excitement. He wants you to live in the love. That's another word for an intense emotional expression. You're just going to have to get out of your, out of your influences that belong to the prince of the power of the air and understand the distinction between good and evil, between right and wrong, that which is acceptable to God and that which is not. And I'm going to tell you, God has told us that the only possible way for you and I to be able to have a distinction between good and evil and right and wrong is by understanding his word by handling his word. And somebody said, well, you're studying the Bible so much. Are you looking for loopholes? No, I'm trying to understand who God made me to be. <laughs> I'm telling you, isn't that weird? You know, the people actually have that kind of a concept of God. But you know what? Here today, we're in, we're in, we're in need. We're in need of those who are like Christ Jesus. And you know, um, the Apostle Paul decided he was, well, I could say James decided he was going to be like Jesus. Because Jesus empowered him. You remember Jesus said, can you drink of the cup that I drink of? If Jesus looked at you and said, can you drink of the cup that I drink of? Would you say yes? Well, if Jesus looked at you and said, could you be baptized with the same baptism that I'm baptized with? Would you say yes? Well, God wants to bring you to that place. See, James and John got to hang around with Jesus long enough to realize that that's exactly what was the whole program and the plan. So they were like, absolutely, of course we can, cuz. Are you listening to me? Yeah. Of course we can. And there's reason to believe that there was cousin relationship there. Are you listening to me yeah. over here? God, Father has taken us to a place to where that he wants us to believe more than we're just cousins. Huh? Are you listening to me? Are you listening to me? He wants, to be, he wants us to believe that we're more than kinsmen. He wants us to believe that we're his brothers and that we're sisters. You know, they said they brought Jesus... Uh, one day they brought um, the mother of Jesus and his brothers and his sisters. And he said, he said, your mother and your brother and your sisters are without, outside the crowd trying to get in. They want to see you. Jesus just stops. He gives no preferential position of kinsmanship to blood relationship. Listen to this. He said, who's my mother? Who's my brother? And who's my sister? But those who do the will of the Father. There's absolutely nothing more important than understanding the will of the Father. And the Word of God is centered on, from Genesis 1 1 to Revelation 22 21, is centered on you and I knowing the will of the Father, and then understanding that Father, in His great goodness and mercy, has brought to us all power, all divine power to enable us and help us to function in that will that has been revealed. He showed us, he's given to us over and over again. And you know, the plan of God is on almost everybody's lips. I would say everybody who has any form of, if, as you, if you would, Christianity. From the Roman Catholics to the Pentecostals. And let's just put that as the spectrum, okay? They got this word on their lips. Father, your will be done. They without excuse. Father, your will be done in this earth as it is in heaven. See, they're without, they're without excuse. All, now, what has happened is many people have stopped short of understanding what the will of God is, even though it starts right there in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21, God declaring his will. It's there highlighted in 1 John 2 verse 17, God declaring his will. The world and the lust thereof shall pass away, but they that do the will of the Father will abide forever. Oh my goodness, and whoa, was that will of God the Father so outlined, so perfectly outlined in the first epistle of John. I know very few people on the planet who's ever memorized the first epistle of John. I know very few people. Very few people have memorized the first epistle of John. And it is absolutely far better than anything you had to memorize of Shakespeare. It is far better than anything you had to memorize of, you know, whatever particular vocation or academic discipline you're interested in. It is the supreme beauty and splendor of all that would reveal to us that which was hidden, that which was not known before, where God outlines his will. And if we will agree with his will, we will agree with what he wants, we find ourselves living in authority and power and divine ability. There's very few people that I have met. I mean, fact, 
I don't know of anyone, in all honesty, I don't know of anyone besides myself, and I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to bring anything that would be self-serving, but just to be an example. I know of no one except for me who has memorized the first epistle of John and the first epistle of Peter. And then I, and, and I go on. I'm sure they're out there somewhere. I just haven't met them yet. But I'm looking at you here today, and I don't care what level of intelligence or IQ you believe you have. God the Holy Ghost has come to give you an ability that goes beyond all your teachers if you just believe them. Amen. He'll heal your mind. I don't care how many drugs you had, how much alcohol, I don't care how you wasted your life. God will heal you. Hallelujah. Amen. He'll give you the ability. I don't care about your short-term ministry, memory, uh, short-term ministries, right? That's short-term <laughs> memory issues. God will give you a long, extended memory. He'll bring all things into your remembrance. Hallelujah. Praise God. All you got to do is want. All you got to do is hunger. People need to start wanting, hungering, thirsting for the word of God instead of Christian philosophy. Well, I don't agree with you, brother. Well, on the, what basis do you not agree with me? On what basis of the written word of God do you not agree with me? And that's where everybody just kind of hushes. And they want to speak from the position of inference and the position of opinion. Listen. People, God's calling you, come live by the word. Hallelujah. Amen. To walk in the word, same thing as living by the Holy Ghost and walking in the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Because the word and the Holy Ghost, they bear witness to one and the same thing. I'm going to talk to you about something radical here this morning, if I haven't already. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I pray that maybe just one person will hear me. Because if one person can hear me, we've got another one in the number. If two, my, that'd just be beyond my expectation. God's always willing to do that. Eh? Doesn't he move beyond our expectation? He does. He does. He does. He moves beyond all that we can think or ask. It does. That's expectation. I know that expectation can be personalized as a big part of faith. But God takes us to places and realms of faith and an adventure of discovering those things that he's made available to us that goes beyond anything that belongs to our experience. All of your judgment, listen to me, all of your judgment of how you conclude and how you interpret and how you hear is based on your experience. That's it. You're trying to draw off all that you've been through since you can remember. And even before you can remember, you were, you know, when you were basically having a hard time balancing and you'd fall and hit yourself, your head on the uh, coffee table. Those kinds of things are still there. That's your experiences. That this kind of continually was built upon that foundation and all that you learned in school and all the way the people have treated you and all the ideas of philosophical opinions that have been stuffed into your head because your mom and daddy thought it was so important for you to get a good education. Listen to the silence. <laughs> Listen to the silence. Because I'm going to tell you right now, our education system was not designed by the Father. And if it were, it would produce His fruits. But I'm going to tell you right now, our education produces a totally different kind of fruit. So you can, if you don't understand, you can just back calculate. You can do reverse engineering on that equation. And you can discover exactly where you, where you stand. The Father wants to take us into a place and help us to understand something that goes beyond our experience so that we're not always hearing and reasoning and thinking and believing based upon what happened to us yesterday or last year. And usually that's going to be a whole bunch of failure and a whole bunch of sense of rejection and a whole bunch of ideas that are totally false with respect to who God has made us and given us the ability to be. See, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, forgive me, in chapter 1, the Lord told us in, verse chapter, in, in, in chapter 1, verse 3, He said, according to His divine power, He gave us everything we need. Amen. He's fully resourced us with His life and with His godliness. So don't Amen. tell me about how you need this or that or the other thing because then you're looking to another Jesus, another hope, another cross, another means of salvation. huh? Don't tell me about it. I don't want to hear it. I want nothing to do with it. I'm going to bring you to the cross of Calvary. I'm going to bring you to the only place of change. I'm going to bring, bring you to an empty tomb. I'm going to bring you to a resurrected Jesus who's seated at the right hand of the Father who's enthroned with all majesty and power above all principality and power and might and dominion. I'm going to bring you to a place where the Holy Ghost can take you and baptize you after that you've been born of Him. Baptize you in His glory and His power and say, this is where you find the overcoming power that overcomes the world. This is where you'll understand the conquering power that conquered the world. 
This is the faith. This is the faith. People want to make the faith of Jesus Christ about something that they could, as it were, contrast between, uh, and let me use this term loosely because there is no such thing, a Hindu faith, a Jewish faith, a Muslim faith, uh, this kind of faith. There is no such thing as a Hindu faith, a Jewish faith, a Muslim faith. There is only one faith, a Buddhist faith. There is only one faith. It's something that belongs to God and God alone. You can't come steal a word from the word of God and use it for your own purposes. And it'd be right. Faith does not exist outside the word of God and is not, is not supplied outside of the cross of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the supply of the Holy Ghost. It's a supernatural working power of the Almighty in you and me. You listen to me. It's faith. It's one faith, one Father, one God. Just one. Hallelujah. I was with a Muslim the other day. He said, oh yeah, we, he said, oh, yeah, we serve and worship the same God. I said, well, that's amazing to me. I didn't know you guys worshiped Jesus. <laughs> because people have so diluted. They'll say Christ. They'll say Father. They'll say Lord. But let's get down to reality. Let's get down to the name that is above every name. Yeah. Let's get down to the sonship qualification of authority and power as many as believe upon his name. Yes. Yeah. The name of Jesus is highly exalted. Yeah. Suddenly everybody starts wait, you know, backing up going, oh, I guess we don't serve the same God. Oh, did you forget that Jesus Christ is God? Hallelujah. Did you forget that he is God, that he is Lord, that he is almighty, that he is the everlasting father, the prince of peace? Amen. His name is wonderful, counselor, mighty God, the everlasting father. Hallelujah. So I said, oh, you're Jesus only. Oh, I'm only in Jesus, but I'm going to tell you, I got the father and the Holy Ghost too. Are you listening to me? I got the father. Hallelujah. He that has the son has the father also. I'm not saying they're not distinct persons. I'm telling you, you can't have one without the other. Hallelujah. I'm telling you, they're equally God. Hallelujah. It just says a miracle that God has came, became flesh. He became flesh. And forever, forever will have a human resurrected body. Because he loves us so much, and I'm sorry that you can't understand that love, but God wants you to understand it. And it's going to begin where you feel offended and rejected and abused and mistreated, and yet you go ahead and lay down your life for the brethren and you don't break covenant. Now, if that's too much for you, we got a tape. You can listen to it over and over again. It's on YouTube until you get it. Amen. But this is where it all starts. Somebody said, what is it going to be like on that day? Here's what it's going to be like. Father's going to bring into question of how well you loved. He's going to bring into question of how well you loved. He's going to start with your wife or your husband. And he's going to work to your children. <laughs> then he's going to go to your brothers and your sisters. <laughs> he's, going to go to your, he's going to go to your cousins and your, your relatives and your aunts and your uncles and your second cousins. Amen. He's going to work his way out. Hallelujah. Amen. To the people that you gather together with in the church. Yes. Amen. It's fundamental to the reality of truth. It is the fruit that, God, that reveals whether or not we've been born of God or not. It's the will of the Father exposed in our conduct and our deed and our character. Listen to me now. It's being able now through this understanding and through this knowledge and through this divine help to be able to resist the prince of the power of the air, the spirit of this world, the God of this world that works in the children of disobedience with all of its hate and all of its strife and all of its envy and all of its backbiting and all of its abuses and all of its, you know, iniquity. God has given to us according to his divine ability, a divine power, divine ability. I got God power. Hallelujah. Uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they God power. They're the power of God at work. The power, I said the power of God at work. Yes. Say, I have the power of God at work. I Say, I have the power of God at work in me. If you've been born again, then you are the temple of the living God. And if you don't believe you're the temple of the living God, then you've not come into the faith to be born again. Are you listening to me? God dwells in you. Christ Jesus dwells in you. The Father dwells in you. The Holy Ghost dwells in you. And you've got a problem. Somebody said, you don't understand my unique circumstance. Oh, yeah, I do. I understand your unique circumstance. You've been born again, a new, made a new creation, given a new heart, new spirit. The Spirit of the living God has come on the inside of you. God's made you the temple of, uh, that he himself dwells in. Father is there uh, interceding for you. Christ Jesus there interceding for you. Holy Ghost interceding for you. Everybody's grouped up together and all heaven's power has been made available to you to overcome anything that you face. That's your unique circumstances. Now, what were you saying? Now, what were you saying? Now, what were you saying? I understand your unique circumstances. Now, what were you saying about your unique circumstances? <laughs> Jesus, who was tempted in all areas as we are tested and tempted. It wasn't a dry run. God risked all the universe to save us. God risked all creation, all that he ever was, and all that he ever is to save us. He did. Jesus was tempted in all ways which we were, which we were tempted. In every way. 
It's not a dry run. I don't care about your Christian ideology and your Christian theology. I'm telling you about the reality of what is there written as simple terminology for anyone to understand. God risked all creation to save you and me. Amen. He vested it all in Christ Jesus. Oh, the eternal God learned obedience. He learned obedience. Are you learning it? God, the eternal God made flesh, learned obedience. Are you willing to obey? I'm telling you, nobody will be without excuse, will have an excuse on that day. God himself will be, Christ Jesus himself will be standing there saying, no, I went through that. No, I was tested in the same way. I condemned sin in the flesh. <laughs> no, I went through that too. No, don't tell me about that. No, I made provision. I gave you everything that pertains. By my divine power, I gave to you everything. By my divine power, by God, my God power, I gave to you everything that pertains to life, and godliness, because I've called you to glory and I've called you to virtue. I've called you to glory and I've called you to purity. Listen to me, many people have not had the spiritual wisdom and insight come to them yet to understand how glorious it is to live in purity and holiness. It is a beautiful realm because everything that is imposed upon us by the God of this world tells us that the opposite's where the fun's at, that the opposite's where the good time is, that the opposite is where all the excitement is going down, that the opposite is where the life is when in reality it's the death. Listen to me. Oh, God has called us to glory and purity, expressed in the model of Christ Jesus. People talking about, oh, I'm looking for another model of revival. We need a new model of revival. No, I don't want another model. I want the model Christ Jesus. I want the model Pentecost, the model, Pen the model Pentecost. Hallelujah. I want you to understand that God's looking to raise up deliverers right now in the United States of America. I tell you right now we are experiencing a Western society spring, a Western spring. Yeah. You can see it in the UK, you can see it throughout all the Western civilization, the Greco-Roman Empire and its consequence that we now exist in today in the Western world. It's happening right here in the United States of America, just like it happened in Egypt, just like it happened, we, I can go, Tunisia, just like it happened in, the, in other places in the Middle East when we talked about a, a Middle Eastern spring. It's happening. It's happening. I got off the airplane here in San Diego last night and there stood a policeman with an AR-14. 15, forgive me, machine gun. I'm not, I see that in Nepal, I see that in Kashmir, I see that in Egypt, I see that in third world countries ruled by dictators under a police state has no place in the United States of America. I am insulted by it. I'm insulted by it. This, this a nation that was born for the purposes of the kingdom of God to take the message of salvation to the darkest regions of the world. God gave us the torch as it were I'm telling you right now, I'm not standing for it. And God's, wants, God's looking for some people who won't stand for it, whom he can raise up to be deliverers. I'm not, only Christ Jesus, only the church can make America great again. People go and try to put their faith in some kind of a president. Our whole governmental, our whole governmental system was not even created like that. It's not even created to exist like that. It's not even created to work. It was never even believed or imagined that it would work in such a mindset. Not on, not on a governmental level, nor on a spiritual level. Are you listening to me? Uh, God's going to raise up some deliverers. Hallelujah. He's going to raise up some deliverers because some people aren't going to trust in guns. They're going to trust in the sword of the Spirit. Huh? Some people are gonna, not going to trust in government to protect them. They're going to get down on their knees and pray. And through prayer, they're going to understand divine protection. When God is with you, I feel sorry for your enemies. Hallelujah. When God is with you, hallelujah, I feel sorry for your enemies. <laughs> so I said, oh, what about a nuclear bomb? What about this? What about China and Russia having military exercises for the past 10 years? Oh, they got a military that just causes, it, 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 it dwarfs the United States military. What holds them back? The power of God. Because there's still people on their knees crying out for revival in the United States of America. Oh, God, do it once again. Hey, listen, I know for a fact that we crossed the line of decision back in 2010. I understand this in God. I understand this. But can God come and, and deliver a demon-possessed nation overrun with immorality? Absolutely. How is he going to do it? Through deliverers. People just like Jesus who buy into his life, hallelujah, and his ministry, hallelujah, who become heirs of God and join in, in inheritors with Christ Jesus. Understand that every time you look at the definition of sonship in the Bible, beginning with John chapter 1, verse 14, looking at sonship in the Bible, then going on to Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, which defines sonship in the Bible. Then going on to Galatians chapter 4, verses 3 through 7, that defines sonship in the Bible. If you can't keep up, you can praise God for a YouTube. 
But you better get this because if you let it go, if you let it slip, you're missing out on the greatest uh, vocation, the greatest opportunity, the greatest calling, the greatest, the greatest privilege that you have ever, could ever possibly imagine would be extended to you. People sit and listen to the Word of God like it's some kind of philosophical religious ideology invented by men. No, it's the Word of God that is a power unto salvation. And if you believe it, you can rise up and begin to do what God has told you you could do and be what He's told you could be. This is not no motivational speaking. This is to tell you to get moving in the faith and start taking a hold of what God has, has given. This is the means of His salvation. The church is His vehicle. Jesus went away. Hallelujah. And it's only found in the midst of his church. Hallelujah. Jesus went away, exalted at the right hand of the Father, as far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in the world to come. So make sure you talk too fast. No, I'm not. I'm, I'm, no, I'm not. I'm talking for everybody who can hear by the Spirit. And you got words that you can understand and discern. Listen to me. Listen to me. God's talking to you. Father wants to change everything about your life, but you've got to believe what he said. Because you can't walk with him unless you agree with him. And he's not going to agree with you and he's not going to compromise because compromise does not belong to the kingdom of God. Compromise is purely demonic. Agreement belongs to the kingdom of God. God's not looking for compromise. He's not meet, looking to meet you halfway. You've got to come all the way. And he came all the way for you and me. He became the sin offering so that you and I could be made the righteousness of God in him. Are you listening to me? Yes. Huh? Compromise is the devil's game. All he gets you is to, just to give in just a little bit. Just compromise a little bit and he'll take over the whole thing. People, preachers running around talking about how husbands and wife ought to compromise. No, woman, you need to submit to your husband who rules over you. And man, you need to submit to Christ Jesus who rules over you. And if your headship ain't right, then her headship isn't going to be right. And nobody's right, so get it right. Are you listening to me? Yeah. We're going to compromise. A little bit of you and a little bit of me. Oh, yeah, I just now slap feminism. I, sla I just stomped that demon called feminism right in, the, right in the throat. Are you listening to me? I just... I stomped him. I stomped him. And he has more influence in people's lives today in our society than folks know. Your mind will play tricks on you. The way you make decisions, you will not be able to understand. It's convoluted with everything that you bought into and heard that you didn't have a resistance for. The only power and the only shield and the only resistance is the Word of God and the faith that's in Christ Jesus. You're listening to me. I'm telling you the truth. I'm delivering to you the Word of God right out of heaven. I'm giving you the armor of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father's word is a defense for us. May praseto moseka. It is a shield. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thy word, O God. Hallelujah. Is forever settled in heaven. Just, just agree with them and it'll work out great. Husbands and wives, if they would obey, obey God's order, I'm telling you right now, there would be no divorce. Because we don't obey God's order, there's all kinds of divorce right, left, and center. If God's people would just begin to obey his word, there would not be, you won't be finding yourself overcome with sin and darkness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. It's just the places where you compromise, you're not willing to obey. So just to start, just understand, we're without excuse. He's given, us, he's given us everything that we need. Open your Bibles with me real quickly to Obadiah. Obadiah is the smallest of all the prophets. It is the smallest book in the Bible. And the impact of it is huge. It is tremendous. And I know it's difficult to find. First one there wins the prize. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. I'm just going to thumb through the pages here and, and believe in Jesus' name that I also happen to stumble upon it. Obadiah. Obadiah, where be you? one of those things, you know. Can somebody tell me what page it's on? <laughs> Obadiah chapter 1, verse 21. <laughs> Obadiah, hallelujah, there's so much prophetic understanding of what's going to happen in the last days, and if you don't understand that, I'm not going to teach on it out of Obadiah, but it's revealed in Obadiah. Obadiah prophesies many of the same things that Jeremiah prophesied, many of the same things that Isaiah prophesied. He does it in a very condensed way. He does it in, 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 in a very uh, uh, symbolic way in many ways, and, and a parable as well. And, but there's a very important verse of Scripture that I want to highlight to you, verse 21. Before I hit verse 21, I want to just, I want to just spring off of verse 17. So look at verse 17. Um, right here it says... Uh, 
Of course, if I wasn't a Jonah, it would read better. But upon Mount Zion, but upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance. Huh? And there shall be holiness, hallelujah, in the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Uh, you know, people will say, well, you know, there's application to what's going to happen in the millennial reign. And that is true. When Christ Jesus comes and reigns for a thousand years. But we also understand by application that the same things that was prophesied in Joel, that seemingly could only be fulfilled during the millennial reign of Christ Jesus, was applied to the New Testament church. Not only as Peter spoke on the day of Pentecost, but also by the Apostle Paul. So we recognize it. In the last days come, shall come to pass, says, God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. is isn't just for the millennial reign. It's for right now. It's a part of deliverance. The deliverer has stood on Mount Zion. Let me just help you understand a little bit more about my, Mount Zion so that you recognize it's not just a hill in Jerusalem. It's not a hill in Judea. Okay? Are you with me? Yes. It's not a hill in Judea. It's something that existed far before there was ever an earthly Zion, there was a heavenly Zion. And I want to show you that quickly. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. I'm calling God the Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the Lord is calling forth champions. Amen. God the Holy Ghost, God the Spirit of the Lord is calling forth those who will stand up in the strength and the power of His might and His divine ability. Yes. Not with the expressions that you begin to realize or think that you realize is the full-blown expression of revival, but something that looks like these works and greater works, something that looks like this power that can subdue nations, that can work righteousness, that can put to flight the armies of the aliens, that can quench the violence of fire. I mean, if the nuclear bomb falls, no problem. It's going to separate out the holy from the profane because we don't burn. We just like the three Hebrew children in obedience to the word of God the flame will not kindle upon us neither can the floods drown us I don't care about no tsunami I'm gonna be standing there going hallelujah I'm telling you right now listen somebody said you're, you're gonna go this place and that place Kashmir Cuba other places um, you know that are very very dangerous I was with a guy from Afghanistan the other night and he, he said you were in Kashmir and I said yeah he, said, and he had just come over from Kash, uh, from uh, Pakistan um, from uh, Kabul and he was on his way back and he said wow he says uh, Kashmir is dangerous. Now this is a person from Afghanistan, from Kabul, saying, I don't go to Kashmir because it's so dangerous. So I said, how can you go to Kashmir? I felt at home in Kashmir because I'm not redundant. There's just not a lot of people on the planet that are acting like me, talking like me, doing what I'm doing. So therefore I know that I'm going to be kept by the power of God and I don't burn and I don't drown. I wish I were redundant. I wish it wasn't the few doing the work of the many that it gets turned around and I believe in God it's going to happen. Amen. Amen. I hate doing all the work and people standing around to encouraging me. Oh, I praise God. Praise God for you. I pray God gave you the strength of ten oxen, brother. <laughs> you know, give me a break. Why don't you throw in over here? Yeah. I do, you know, listen to me. Hey, listen to me. If you're not going to work, go into the house. Go into the house. So we can at least think maybe you're sick or something. <laughs> Quit posing like you standing out here being a part of Get Busy. God's calling for champions. Yeah. People that won't believe in themselves, but will believe in God who's in them. Huh? Who will begin to believe not in the human factor, but in the God factor. Not in the human condition, but in the divine, the divine position. God created a new race and a new family. When he brought forth Jesus Christ. Whew. And he made a true one new man. Making peace through his cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Of all mankind, hallelujah, he brought, brought forth one new race. True. God's looking for deliverers to be raised up. God's looking for champions. Huh? The other day we were in, we were in the airport and some things were going down in the airport. I said, listen, this isn't freedom. This isn't freedom. What are you doing? This is oppression. And the guy head of the TSA said, this is what we're commanded to do from the people on top. I said, why don't you stand up against them? He said, because if I do, I'll be fired and I don't want to reach, I don't want to have to work at the casino. I said, well, I understand that. I appreciate that. And nothing I can say against that. You've got to be willing to risk everything for freedom. I'm talking about a great, I'm talking about the definition of freedom. He that the sun sets free is free indeed. I'm, I'm talking about the greatest definition of freedom. The truth sets free. Lie brings into bondage. People think freedom is to give everyone the allowance to do whatever evil thing or good thing they can think of. That's not freedom. That's not what we are. That's not who we are. That's not freedom. It's not 
freedom to go and murder people because you feel like rage. It's not freedom to violate the sanctity of marriage because you feel some immoral impulse derived from a demon power. Now freedom is bondage. It's, the, it's immorality overrunning a nation. God's got to have deliverers. Yes. People want God to rend the heavens and come down. I'll tell you right now, He already rend the heavens. He already rend the heavens and He already came down. For those of you who need that. He already rend the heavens and came down. America's just got to have everything just right. Come powder, baby powder my pew. I want the air conditioning set at 71 and a half degrees. <laughs> I want things to be on time, you know. I want the clock there in front of the preacher's eyes so he can see if he's gone two minutes over and recognize that's his warning mark of whether I will come back or not. I tore that thing down. You look behind you. Look behind. Turn around. Look right now. There's no, there's no idol on my wall. Uh, when I go to, I, you know, God sent me to churches all over America, I just let them know, hey, that idol needs to come down. That, that thing of the rule of man's time clock to say, you must accommodate what I'm doing. Look, God's looking to raise up champions not people that need everything done their way. Come on, people. We were just in Cuba. You know how hot it is there? <laughs> I, was in, I was preaching one day in, in uh, where was I? Um, I was in Alexandria, Egypt, and it was like 109 degrees, 109 degrees. And then that period of time uh, in, in Alexandria, Egypt, everybody was afraid that they were going to get killed. This, I was in Assemblies of God Church, and it was packed with people who did not take a shower. I mean, it was wall to wall packed with that kind of body heat. And it's 109 degrees outside, and all the windows are closed so that no one could hear what was going on. People, that's hot. That's hot. We didn't have no fans. We didn't need any fans. My dad was with me. He said, My God, I'd rather be arrested and die than stand to breathe as here anymore. <laughs> Because he's the oldest guy in the place, you know. He stood up and started opening up all the windows. And I felt so free. I mean, I felt so released at that moment. Not only because I could breathe, but because I felt we're getting somewhere now. Now the gospel is going to go out beyond the four walls. Somebody's got to stand up and be a champion. you got to quit wanting it all your way. The luxury, the love of ease. Give me more for me. Come on, people. You and I are given the commission to represent heaven. We are not here to please ourselves. We're here to be the vocal uh, mouth peace of Almighty God. We can't have, we cannot live under a gag order anymore. God's people are going to have to stand up and not give some kind of legislative opinion or judicial ideas, but to speak by the authority of the sons of the living God. Amen. Come on now. Amen. And that begins simply by you beginning to move out in the circles of your influence. Not as a scribe and a Pharisee, not as a philosopher, not as some person that comes along trying to convince someone of your ideology, but as one who has authority as a son of God to speak into people's lives, to talk to them about what's going on in their heart, their pain, their fear, their agony, their loneliness, their rejection. Yes. Yes. To present to them the love of God, the love of Christ Jesus, the only means of salvation. Yes. Come on, people. Yes. God's looking to raise up deliverers. Yes. God's looking to raise up on Mount Zion and deliver us. And so look with me in Hebrews chapter 12 because I want you to understand. Hold your finger on Obadiah. It's so hard to find the first place. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12. Don't lose it. Don't have to go through that again. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12. That was painful, huh? Hebrews chapter 12, <laughs> verse 23. Are you there? Yeah. The scripture reads this. Forgive me, verse 22. He says, but you are come unto Mount Zion... See, the contrast between what happened in the, under the law during the time that Moses came, having seen the glory of God and sent by the Father to bring forth the covenant in contrast to Jesus Christ and the church right now. He says, right now, listen, right now, God has told us that we're in a heavenly realm. We're in heavenly places that we're seated together in a heavenly place. I hear all these philosophical ideas, but the creed of what God described to us and what he delivered to us is that I am crucified with Christ. I am buried with him by baptism into his death. I am raised up together with him. I am alive together with him. And I'm seated in the heavenly realm together with him. People, it's, it's time we believe God's word. Somebody said, oh, that's positional. Get out of your philosophy. I had two preachers on the phone with me the other day, and they were asking me about a particular subject. And so we were talking through, and I was giving them verses of scripture, and then someone started giving me giving me anecdotals. I said, you will now pull me over into Christian philosophy? And every one of them got a revelation right there. They go, wow, 
Pastor, wow, you're right. I'm going to try to, exp exp I'm going to try to explain God and what he does based upon my human experience and observation. Come on, people. Get out of your anecdotals and get over into the truth. This isn't fact. This is truth. Truth is superior to fact. Hallelujah. Huh? Fact says you've got 10 bucks in your bank account. The truth says God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. What you going to believe? Uh, should I run? Should I take you through the drill? I know this may be very hard and difficult for some people to sit through. Because this challenges everything about your paradigm. It challenges everything about what you, how you move, how you act. It's once again, as I was saying by the Spirit of the Lord about a week ago, people stand at the crossroads of, uh, of decision and they make a decision of whether they're going to do what God's called them to do based upon how much money they have or based upon what God has said in His Word. You cannot serve mammon. You cannot serve money. You cannot serve, serve your material ability and serve God at the same time. You will love one and hate the other. You better get your eyes single and your whole being will be full of light and God will have a champion in you. Amen. God's word will not return unto void. His word that goes forth out of my mouth shall not return unto him void. Hallelujah. I know what the scripture says. My word which goes forth out of my mouth shall not return unto me void, but shall accomplish those things which I have intended. But when I speak his word, then his word that goes forth out of my mouth, hallelujah, shall not return unto him void. Hallelujah. Come on, people. It's about time we get into airship and join airship. It's about time we get into the family. It's about time we start being the church that God has called us to be, to have both the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. That's the champion. That's the deliverers that he raises up. No, hold up. I'm getting ahead of myself again, trying to hurry so that I can keep your attention for more than five minutes. As you've been trained... Huh? by the media, quit watching television because it's full of every demonic suggestion and every stronghold that's going to cause you to doubt what God said. And people run around saying, why can't I? Why do I have so much doubt and so much unbelief? Because you're feeding yourself with so much poison and so many demonic suggestions. The worst part about sin and failure is Satan's able to get in there and accuse you and berate you and make you feel further and more distant from God. Yes, that's the worst part of it. It's the worst part of it. Man, you come over here and you lay hold upon this wonderful divine grace that has been given to you. You'll get built up in the faith, boldness, insight, wisdom, understanding will take a hold of you. You'll know that God speaks through your mouth and everything he says is going to come to pass. Amen. Amen. God's looking to raise up champions and deliverers because that's the only thing that's going to change America. Oh yeah, things are, things are shifting. I'm going to tell you right now, it's shifting big time. But Father is going to allow it. God is going to do it yet once again. Amen. Yet strengthen me yet one more time, oh God. Hey, we haven't seen the signs and the wonders and the miracles that took place in the 30s and the 40s, that took place in the teens and in the 20s here in the United States of America. The signs and the wonders, the great Holy Ghost conviction that would fall during the revivals of the Cane Ridge revival and the revival, revivals that took place during the time of Finney and the revivals that took place during the time of Wesley and Whitfield. Did you know that every great revival and outpouring of the Holy Ghost followed a freedom in the United States of America? Did you know that the preaching of Wesley and Whitfield and all those surrounded them gave birth to the Constitution of the United States of America? Hallelujah. The declaration of a new experiment that had never been seen on the planet before. Did you understand that this God this kind of constitution, this kind of government only works by those who are devoted to the fear of the Lord? Yes. Do you understand that? Why It's why we stand in God we trust everywhere. Huh? Yes. That's, why, that's why America the Beautiful is such a great song, such a great hymn, and it gives testimony to the wonderful works of Christ Jesus yes. and the power of God being our God. Do you understand that it was the miracle, it was the, the great revivals of, of Finney that brought forth that, 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 that next step of uh, of freedom under Andrew Jackson, where now you just didn't, you, you could all of a sudden be, become a part of voting and become a part of an exercise of the government, even if you didn't own land and have a certain amount of possession up until that time. If you didn't own land and have a certain amount of possession, you had no rights. Do you understand every advancement of freedom? Do you understand that was the second great awakening? Do you understand that? Do you understand that, yes, their nation has been overrun by, by immorality. But people, I, I've just been in Cuba. I just had the Spirit of the Lord lay upon my heart to see Fidel Castro be born again and, and be able to talk with Raul Castro. The door has already been opened for me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that. I've just been in Kashmir. You talk about being overrun with the powers of darkness. Come on, people, I'm telling you right now, America is easy, easy breezy, as they say. Easy, easy. God's just looking for some champions. I'm not going to be gripped by fear or oh, I'm going to carry my gun around. What are you talking about? I'm going to carry your gun around. 
preachers, some of the great preachers now that are here in the United States of America talk about carrying their gun around. Well, what are you going to do? Because if you, anybody you need that gun against, you've got to be devoted to kill them the first two seconds. It's a three-second rule. Because that person's looking down, the, looking at you. He's, he's, already, he's already dedicated. He's taking you out. What man of God or woman of God is ever going, that's not champions. God's looking for some people who know that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. God's looking for some people who know how to subdue nations, who act like Elijah and, and beyond, who act like Jesus, who act like the Apostle Paul, who have this authority, that not, I mean, who act like the, the Apostle John. You can't burn him in oil. He won't boil. You can't exile him on the island where there's nothing there. He won't starve. He's kept by the power of God Amen. through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed. I'm ready to be revealed. I'm ready to be manifested as a son of God. All right, God's looking for champions. The Lord says he's, that we've come to Zion, verse 22, but we've come to Zion, the city of the living God. Have you come to Zion, the city of the living God? This is what the church is. I know you think that it's something that belongs to a public opinion of a religious persuasion. But it is the very living power and foundation of Almighty God. The very personification of Christ Jesus in the earth today. Amen. And the body itself is only expressed by the gifts of the Spirit. Paul only talked about the church being the body of Christ in the context of the expression of the manifestation of the Holy Ghost that functions in each one of us. Otherwise, there's no expression of the diverse membership of the body of Christ. Go read 1 Corinthians chapter 12 again. Understand, God's people are going to have to be valiant for good, valiant for righteousness, valiant to do the word of the Lord instead of the opposite. Go read Jeremiah. God's people become valiant to do just the opposite. They become valiant for their own causes, valiant to do wickedness, valiant to do evil. And their rulers and their shepherds and their leaders taught them how to commit fornication. Same thing going on in the church today. You look, if you just start reading, just start reading 1 and 2 Kings and 1 and 2 Chronicles. 1 and 2 Kings really focuses on the northern tribes of Israel. And 1 and 2 Chronicles focuses on the southern tribes of Israel. And you can see what their shepherds did to them. And you can see it repeated in the midst of his church. God to give you understanding. And you'll see where the downfall came when the sons of Judah married in to the daughters of Jezebel. Huh? The son of Jehoshaphat married Ahab and Jezebel's daughter. And then his son that ruled married the daughter of Omri, who was also a wicked king in Israel. And their mothers taught them to do wickedness and to teach all of Israel to commit fornication as they worshipped the queen of heaven, the mother of harlots. And it goes on. And you see the repetition of it in the church. God's looking for some champions. We've come unto Zion. That's where we're at right now. You may think you're just standing, you're sitting there listening to some preacher talk to you these things that maybe some of you have never heard before. But I tell you right now, you in the holy place. You stand in the midst of the, of the presence of Christ Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the Almighty God. You stand in something so sacred to Father that he's made it something almost on another level of the holies of holies. True? Which he rent the veil that separated us as a representation of the very body and person of Jesus Christ, which is what communion is all about. That you stepped into the holies of holies by the broken body. You're eating the flesh of the rent veil that, uh, that separated man from the holy, holies of holies. And now we've come into the holies of holies. And even more radical than that, the holies of holies has come into us. For Father dwells in us and Father doesn't dwell outside the holies of holies. Are you listening to me? Holiness is defined by the person and presence of God where he is separated from all other things. And the almighty, holy, holy, holy God dwells in me. I mean, the, the angels look on it and they're so filled with excitement and so filled with, it, let me give it this word, adrenaline. They're so filled with the overwhelming presence of Almighty God that they build their face and scream night and day, holy, holy, holy. Night and day, they do not rest. They do not rest. Holy, holy, holy. It's so full of excitement you can't rest. You ever been so full of excitement you can't rest? Because that big event's coming down tomorrow? Huh? Are you listening to me? Can you imagine? Can you imagine what your eyes can see? Can you imagine? I know you've had a taste of joy, but it goes far beyond that. There is a realm of joy that you cannot even begin to, to, begin to consider unless you've tasted the joy that comes from His salvation. Come on, people. There's a realm of love 
that we barely scratch the surface of. Come on, there is a place of divine power and authority, a place of goodness, a place of salvation, a place of heaven, a mantle of the glory of God that has been made available that we've not even really explored. If science was a reflection of the exploration and discovery of the church, we would still be in what would be classically called the Stone Age, living as cavemen and had not invented the wheel yet. Are you listening to me? Come on, it's time to explore and discover the depths and the heights and the breadth and the glory and the vastness of the immutable, unchangeable, eternal and almighty God. He made the door for us, Christ Jesus. He's open and he says, come on in. God's looking for deliverers. You've got to get rid of your distractions. God's looking for deliverers. So what? You build a business. You become successful. So what? You've got to build a bank account. You have a retirement plan. You're too old to enjoy it. What are you going to do with that cruise anyways? Because there's nothing but lust and iniquity on the thing. Huh? Are you listening to me? There's nothing but filth and demonic stuff everywhere you got out there to go spend your money you worked all your life to save up now that you're 78 years old and you wasted your life when you could have been raised up to be mighty in God you could have stand somewhere in an unreached people group and laid your life down for Jesus Christ be shot full of arrows and died in glory come on man that's how Papua New Guinea was turned that's how Papua New Guinea was turned they shot, a, they shot that missionary in the late 1800s so full of arrows that they, be, early 1900s, forgive me, so full of arrows that they begin to fall down and plead with him to die. He wouldn't die. She hit him on another one. He's still preaching. God loves you. He sent his only begotten son to die for you. Shoot him with another arrow. He was so shot full of arrows. They pled with him. And then they turned and said, we will give our lives to Jesus if you will just die. <laughs> Pretty radical, huh? No one can tell the story as well as evangelist Tim Hall. It's a great one. It is a great one. You could, do, you could have done that. Come on. You could begin to reach into God to have a missions plan for Saudi Arabia, or Saudi Arabia, Arabia on Ramadan. Like being translated in on a Ramadan day. And grabbing the mic on the platform and preaching Jesus. And as soon as they try to lay hands on you, you disappear like Jesus. <laughs> Give them 30 minutes to think about it, then reappear. Everybody's going to listen. What a missions plan. A tr of taking a hold of the power of God. These works and greater works. Yes. Hallelujah. Of finding your life so filled with the Spirit, so captivated by the ministry of heaven, so given over to airship, so given over to the ministry and the life of Jesus Christ. You're on a whole other dimension of what living is all about. He that has the Son has this life. And God by His divine power gave us everything we need according to His life and godliness to do His life and godliness because He called us to glory and purity. Come on, people. And so Peter cries out, give all diligence to making your calling and election sure. Cries out, give yourself continually to have these things mature in your life. He says, cries out, says, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, I should, do, I should give myself to stirring you up, bringing you into remembrance of these things. I took that torch. What torch are you going to take? There's mantles right now, the mantle of Christ Jesus. Look at Elisha. He was a wealthy man, a man of, a man of talent and skill and provision. A man who would be viewed as a leader in his community. An upstanding businessman. He had all that he needed in, in, in terms of the luxury of life, I guarantee you. But the mantle of Elijah was so much more precious to him than all that he had. He plowed with 12 yoke of oxen. He was plowing with one. He had 11 others plowing. He had, he had contracts to fulfill. He had business opportunities that he had negotiated. He had it all planned out. He was a man of means and ability. When the mantle came, he chose that above all other things. He said, just give me time to make one big barbecue. I'm taking all 12 yoke of oxen. We're taking the plow and all of my instruments of business. And we're going to put it upon the altar. And we're going to offer it up as a fire unto the living God. And we're going to have a sacrifice and a celebration. Because I'm going into the ministry now to be the, to be the yes man for Elijah. To be the guy who washes his hands. Who pours water on the hands of the prophet. A mighty man to a slave man. Uh, come on, people. God's looking for some folks that he can raise up to be champions. And you've got to come to understand that before 
honor, there's humility, that there's a place of lowliness and meekness. You and I have got to come to observe. We've had false models. Everybody talking about a wealth that doesn't come from God, something that they lavish upon themselves for their own interests, and there's no divine advancement of the purposes of, of God and the will of the Father. It's time to, re it's time to get up and, and, and I say rewrite it, just erase all that you've Amen. been hearing yeah. and go ahead and listen to what has been written, how, what has been yeah. laid down. And follow the model of Christ Jesus. He says, come and learn of me. I'm meek and lowly. I understand that Mount Zion is speaking of that heavenly realm, is speaking of the church. I'm going to try to wrap this up. And I said, I did not lie. I said, try to wrap this up. I'm, I'm not under my own inspiration here. I belong to another. If you've got a problem, blame him. Uh, and he will deal with you <laughs> mercifully, mercifully, and tenderly. But he will deal with you. But ye are coming to Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable, co innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Go back to Obadiah, because if I keep reading, I'm going to get into that big time. I won't be able to escape. So quickly... Quickly go back to Obadiah. Hopefully you followed instruction, kept your finger on Obadiah. Obadiah 1.21, look at it. And deliverers shall come up upon Mount Zion. I watched as deliverers have come up upon Mount Zion. George Whitfield. I'll just start early 1700s. Charles, uh, John, John Wesley, Charles Finney. I can go on recent ones. Uh, deliverers that came up like Evan Roberts. Deliverers that have came up like Pop Seymour, John G. Lake, the Ritchie Brothers, F.F. F. Bosworth, uh, Wigglesworth. More recent ones, deliverers that God would raise up. I watched it as a, as a, you know, as a young child to see Oral Roberts when he was raised up, Jack Cole, people with signs and wonders. He could go back and talk about Alexander Dowie and, and more recent ones like A. a. Allen. You know, yeah, many people were raised up and then they, they fell. But that didn't change nothing. God's going to raise up people who aren't going to fall and stumble in iniquity and bring shame and reproach to the cross of Jesus Christ. He's going to raise up. Father's looking for uh, people that are resilient, who, know, who are valiant to do good, who know how to stand in the strength of the Lord and the power of His might. Will you be willing to be trained? Because God's not going to just snatch you up and use you when you're not even able to overcome some little basic lust of the flesh and lust of the eye. Because I'm going to tell you, the devil's going to come at you so much stronger. I love hearing the one who organized the Assemblies of God, P.C. Nelson, the great organizer of the Assemblies of God, when the Assemblies of God was on, the fi on fire and the fires of the Holy Ghost. He talked about being in the meeting with Alexander Dowie, and there was a woman there. And she had a, a, such a huge tumor. It was like a second head. And the tumor now had grown down into her mouth and was going into her throat and choke, choke her, beginning to choke her. So demonic, hey? So demonic. Somebody said that's just some natural consequence of, of, of physiology, of physiological chemistry and biochemistry gone awry. No, it's demonic. Huh? And he said, P.C. Nelson said as a witness, and we're talking about a man of upstanding integrity. He's the one who started Southwestern University of Assembly of God. Everything that was academic, everything that was organized as Assembly of God, it was P.C. Nelson who organized that. He was a man of impeccable, impeccable integrity. He said, I sat there and I watched as Alexander Dowie just reached over took the tumor in his hand, peeled it off of the woman, and there was nothing but fresh skin and flesh there. Just peeled it, just reached over under the authority of God and just peeled it off of her. It's time to see people step over into a realm of divine authority where there, there is a deliverer in Zion and associated with it is holiness. Yeah. Dear people, I'm an under, I understand the anointing and the display of the power of God. It's directly proportional to a consecration, to his ways, to his place of living, to his habitation, which is called holiness. Come on now. I tell you right now, I don't care what kind of fun you're having in the lust of the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eye. It's far more enjoyable, far more fun, and far more exciting to be over in this place called the Holy Spirit, over the holies of holies, over in this realm called heavenly, over in this place called communion with the, with the holy God, having innumerable a company of angels surrounding you, and Christ Jesus living, dwelling on the inside of you, and being Lord and King over you. Come on now. Come on now. Having eyes full of in, in adultery, they could not cease from sin. That's, Paul, that's Peter's declaration of the coming apostasy. Second Peter chapter 3, having eyes full of adultery. Never in time 
Has we, have we seen that scripture come so close to be fulfilled as we see a world community developed around the internet and God's people who have no discretion to be able to say no to what their eyes are going to behold and what they're going to set before them. They have no discipline, no basic human discipline to recognize what's wrong and what's right and they have no part of it. Come on, people, God wants to make you valiant. He wants to raise up yeah, champions yeah, yeah. in this hour, at this Thank time. You. People who are valiant to do righteousness, they're valiant to do good, valiant to do the will of the Father, valiant to stand for the kingdom of God. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 21 says, And I will, and deliver, deliver shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the Mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Understand, people, there is no way that this is fully realized in the millennial reign of Christ because Esau will be destroyed when Christ Jesus comes. Who is this that comes from Bozrah with his garments dipped in blood? Hmm? That's Edom. Edom will cease to exist. He will make Edom a hole that goes down into hell that men can come and look and see. People said it's Babylon. You need to read again. It's Edom. It's Timon and Bozrah, which are nothing but rock rubble right now, but they will be they will be signs and wonders to the nations in the last day. They will be great enterprises in the last day. And, you know, if you've never, if you've never understood that, and I'm not trying to advertise my book, uh, Charisma is getting ready to publish a book that I did on, on helping to understand the coming signs, to, un to know where we're going, what's going on, what will happen between now and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, because there's many events that will happen that will take place clearly before His second coming. And some events that will take place before Christ Jesus comes to, to catch away the church. Believe me, I've been in this a long time, dear people. I remember, I've seen a lot of people come to Jesus because uh, he's coming back and the rapture is going to take place next week. And they came to Jesus based upon a false representation of the gospel. They didn't come to Jesus for the cross. They came to Jesus because they were persuaded in an emotional speech and presentation that Jesus was coming back next week and here are the proofs. And those proofs failed to materialize. And so therefore the representative of Christ Jesus and the, and, and the gospel was invalidated. Are you listening to me? Because it's true. That's the 70s. If we wrote a paragraph about the 70s, that would be it. Many people that are in the 70s that came across are new age leaders right now. Hindus. On, I could go on and on. Many great men of God that I knew. People anointed of God. People that wrote great songs. I was in those meetings. I was in those meetings in the 60s. I was there. My dad's a revivalist. I was there. I was in those meetings. I was in the Jesus revival. I was there. I understand the anointing and the presence and the feel of Holy Ghost conviction. I, I can feel it again. I feel it again. I feel the same movings of what we felt in the 60s. I feel it's happening. The things that I was there as a little guy on the back end of the great wave of what we call the healing revival of the 40s and the 50s. I was there. I sat with Oral Roberts one time and he was a pretty old man. He was probably about 84 at the time. I said, Oral, you know, I said, I was there in your meetings in Bluefield, West Virginia. His eyes got really big. He said, wow, those were mighty meetings. Those were the great signs and wonders of God. Because they were, they were. The Bluefield, West Virginia meetings. I was privileged to be there and watch miracles that you cannot even imagine. Don't tell me about what everybody said about Oral Roberts. Hearsay is not fact. Believe it or not. Are you listening to me? Huh? Gut impressions is not evidence. Are you listening to me? Oh. Come on, people. God has raised up saviors. He's raised up deliverers. He's looking for saviors, deliverers in this age that will stand in the life and ministry of Jesus. The deliverer. Hallelujah. Paul was willing to be that. He said, I went from Jerusalem to Illyricum. There's no difference between you and the Apostle Paul. The only difference is he was willing to give it all. That's it. If there's any difference, is it. It's it. There is the same encounter available for you and me today. Father tests and tries us, and he has the right to, and sees the decisions that we're going to make when we're at those crossroads, deciding whether we're going to obey money or God. He's there looking at us and deciding how he can use us and what he's going to do to develop us when we're there in the secret of our lives and we make choices to come under the impressions and under the domination of demon, demon spirits and the suggestion of fallen angels. He's there searching us, trying us, saying who will be valiant to do that which is righteous? Who will be valiant to take a hold of all the power and the authority? God has not limited us. 
The, uh, the prophets of old, the great prophets of old, that so many people want to be like, they want to be like us. They, would, they looked and saw our day and said, oh, I would love to be in that day where they be given, are given a new spirit and given a new heart and made one with Almighty God and baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire and all God's authority and powers poured out upon them and we spend our inheritance for that which cannot profit. You think about it. Materialism. A house to live in. Clothes to wear. Cars to drive. Money in the bank. A reputation among men. I'm not saying you can't make money for the kingdom, but it better off be going in the kingdom. And if it goes to your lust and your pleasure and your ease, shame on you. Don't say it's God. Don't write God in it. Because if, come on now. If that truth that is in you be lie, how great is that truth? How, forgive me, how great is that lie? If that light which is in you be darkness, how great is that darkness? Mm -hmm. yes. It's time we quit excusing ourselves and self-justifying when God has brought us into a covenant and given us His righteousness, but we must obey His Word. Let the Word of God, the light of His Word, shine upon our lives. Let His Word and the light of His Word be the evaluation of whether we're right or whether we're wrong. Quit self-justifying. Quit trying to make, play make-believe and pretend and compare yourself among one another and say, well, he or she did this or did that. I guess I can do it too. And start looking at the model Christ Jesus because you and I are called to come and follow him and to walk in his footsteps. Yes, you and I are called to come and be baptized with a baptism that he's baptized with. Amen. You and I are called to be his disciples to imitate God. This time, have you been imitating God lately? Are you listening to me? That's a pretty radical word there in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, is beloved children imitate God. Hallelujah. I better be careful. I'm about to start the third sermon right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. God's looking for champions who will respond to the call. God's looking for those who know how to function in the word of knowledge. Ha <laughs> ha. Habataya, in the word of wisdom, who know how to work signs and wonders and miracles, who know how to love righteousness and hate iniquity, yes. who yes. desire holiness and purity and give all diligence yes. to cause it, seeing those things per, be perfected in their life, who love his presence, his manifest glory, who want to be in heaven and not in hell, who want to walk with him in righteousness and not walk in their own way. God's looking for a people who will be valiant to do that, which is right. Would you stand with me? God's looking for a people. God's looking for a people. God's looking for people. I tell you, dear people, is there's ever a time that I want to see God use me in the United States of America? It's right now. I praise God for the doors that are opening. I, I just had a 5,000 square foot tent given to me. Hallelujah. A friend of mine, a signs and wonders miracle friend of mine. We've been friends since 14 years old. He died of a massive heart attack at the beginning of the year. He had just brought a 5,000 square foot, brand new 5,000 square foot tent. His wife said there's no person on earth that he would rather have this tent go to than you. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said, I'm coming to pick it up. i got to find somebody to volunteer to go get it. Because uh, I don't want to pay it. I don't want to pay a crazy cost for somebody else to get it. Who knows where they, they'll probably get lost with it anyways. Besides that, I'm looking for some people to sow into the kingdom. Huh? Why let the wicked do the work of the righteous anyways? Huh? Come on, people. You don't need to make yourself wealthy. God stored up the, the wealth of the wicked to give it to the righteous. Father does it all by miracle, not by the arm of flesh or human ability, but by signs and wonders and demonstration of his power. If you're there speaking the gospel, speaking the word of life, and, and riches and wealth comes, and God adds it to you, and that's going right into the kingdom of God, then you can be certain it's the wealth that God gives. If it's not that way, then it's not his. If the wealth that God gives is causing you to be that much more of those who sow forth the covenant and the covenant's established through, then you can be certain that it's go what God gives. If the wealth that you have is causing more distraction, thrusting you through with many darts and afflictions and temptation, you can understand that that's the wealth that the arm of flesh gives. God said, cursed is the man who trusts in the arm of flesh. He said, blessed are those who trust in the Lord and make him the sole object of his trust. Understand, this is the whole principle. Adam failed, Abraham succeeded, Jesus personified trusting God. He's called you and I into a supernatural, miraculous realm of trusting him. Come on, people. God's looking for champions. America needs champions. Otherwise, it ain't going to be long. And you're going to see the streets filled with AR-15s on every policeman because it becomes a police state and a martial law condition. Then what are you going to do? Putin's afraid of the church. 
Putin is afraid of the church. He created an anti-terrorism law that looks like it's going to levy such a persecution against the church in Russia again. It's true. The list goes on. And they all are part of the disinformation that goes on in the United States of America on both sides of the aisle that makes the establishment and some elite minority the cause of everybody's problems and creates the uproar and the strife between races. Because that's, uh, that's in the, <laughs> people, that's in the rule book of overthrowing a nation. It's in the rule books. And God's church is blind, cannot see, and plays into the propaganda. The only remedy is deliver us. I watch the Lord. God raised up Jimmy Swaggart. Nobody could do what Jimmy did. No one. He went into Russia when Russia was closed. He went to China when China was closed. You name it, he went there. He was valiant in God. It was a place he was overthrown by and fell in iniquity. As soon as, as, soon as he went out, God raised up Benny Hinn. And Benny was valiant in the anointing. People say, well, I know this and I know that. You don't know anything. You haven't been there, man. What have you done? What have you done? I watched Father. I understand. There is a company of his people that stand. There is a company of God's people that stand beholding his works and his deeds. And not sitting in the judgment seat of the wicked. Condemning the anointing. I don't care how people start. I'm at the end. I'm going to tell you about how they started. God, I care about how they end. But I'm not talking about, it's better said, I'm not talking about how they end. I'm talking about how they started. You don't think Father has to suffer the reproach and hurt over that? But he's raising up men and women right now. I believe this with all of my heart. Who will stand in his glory and execute his will with great demonstration of power. And signs and wonders and miracles that Apostle Paul did and greater as a model Christian. Paul's just a model Christian of one who follows Jesus. That's it. Because even as God separated him to reveal his son in him, he separated you and me to reveal his son, Christ Jesus. That we no longer live. It's Christ who lives. I no longer live. But it's Christ Jesus who lives. This is who he's supposed to be. Get away in him. As a branch in the vine, bearing forth fruit. Jesus said, if you'll live my life, I will live in you. John chapter 15 and verse 3 and 4. If you live my life, I will live in you. Oh, well. That's the resurrected, glorified Jesus. That's not the earthly ministry of Jesus, baptized in the Holy Ghost in power. There's a mantle for you. Are you willing to leave everything and follow Jesus? Are you willing to set it all aside, take up your mantle as those who are the witnesses of heaven, the ministers of righteousness, those who come as the flaming evangels of his word? There's ministering spirits standing with you. Wow. The way that William Branham began. Wow. To have been so close. My dad and other men of God that I knew who sat in those meetings in the early days and watched the power of God displayed on a level that was greater works. To see the majority some said even up to upwards of 90% of everybody who was sick and diseased, no matter what they were, from paraplegics to people born blind, healed in the meetings. You hear the audible voice of God speak in the meeting. Whoa. Champions, deliverers, those who fully embrace the life and ministry of Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost, so that as Paul said, I have preached from Jerusalem to Illyricum, and you talk about opposing immorality. He lived under the rule of the crazy man Nero, the insane emperor, dictator of dictators, demon possessed. He said, I fought with beast at Ephesus. He brought down single handedly the, the, the worship of Artemis, the queen of heaven. 
and turned Ephesus in, from the capital of, of the center of the worship of the mother of harlots to the great church of the Lord Jesus Christ at Ephesus. Who? Come on, God's looking for champions, deliverers, to raise up right now. Jesus, do it again. I said to, I said to Oral Roberts, when his old man, I said, Oral, please, I said, would you pray the prayer with me? Strengthen me yet one more time, God. Because that was the prayer they prayed. Strengthen us yet one more time, Lord. We know that we've broken the covenant. And we're like Samson with our hair cut off and our eyes plucked out. That we've disobeyed you. That we've laid our heads in the lap of the prostitute. That we've turned your glory into corruption. Strengthen us yet one more time, oh God. And the signs and the wonders that fell. Evan Roberts in the, in the miracle revival of 1904 that started on September the 26th. He cried out and he prayed a prayer again and again. He said, oh God, I built your altar. I've laid the wood in order according to your word. An altar that's built there in prayer and crying out to God in worship and hunger and thirsting and passion to do thy will, oh God. It is written of me. I've laid your sacrifice upon the altar so you fire now. He prayed that prayer. 1904, he prayed it over and again. 1904 in September, it was a special kind of moving of God. Father had tried and brought forth to man as gold tried in the fire, as silver tried in earthen vessels seven times. He raised up a deliverer in Zion in the midst of his church. In the great Welsh revival that shook the nations of the earth. More missionaries were sent in the unreached people groups at that little period of time. 1906, I know. I'm, I'm, 1906, April 9th, 1906 was a, a direct result of that. Filled right now in Jesus' name. Kisatumran se pikan. Filled from a city in the Rupa. Esikurama. With the right spirit. With the right spirit. Usapan brisikishta. Filled with a valiant spirit. Valiant to do that which is good. A right spirit. The very spirit of the Lord. Father has everything that you need here today. If you've never turned your heart and your life over to the King of Kings, turn your heart over to the kingdom of God, I'm telling you, you should surely perish. The kingdom of God alone will endure forever in Christ Jesus, the King of Kings, and there's no way into it but a changed heart and a changed nature. All you have to do is begin to recognize who God is and understand what He's purpose for man to be, what He's purpose for you to be, and recognize that you can never be it on your own. You must call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and Father's called you and, and chosen you and ordained you, and He's got a deliverer right now to deliver you. There's a deliverer to deliver you right now. God's not going to spoil you. He's going to discipline you. You listen to me. If you went back and read Hebrews chapter 12, you'll find that a lot of that's written to disobedient children. He said he'll discipline you. He'll scourge every son. Flog them. That's what he says. If you're disobedient, God's going to pursue you with everything he can. But oh, what does it look like to be an obedient son? This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I know how to get into that. Let me tell you how to get into that. Get into Jesus. God's calling you. If you're here in this place today, you're watching me right now on the web. You're watching me by YouTube. Christ Jesus is calling you. I break off every mind-blinding spirit, every stronghold of Satan, everything that would lie and deceive you. I destroy it or render it powerless right now that your eyes may be opened. God the Holy Ghost comes to you right now. He poured out a spirit upon all flesh, and that includes you right now. All you have to do is respond with your will, and He will be there. To make you everything that he's purposed you to be. That he's called you to be. And it looks like Jesus. I understand. 
You don't have to make believe it. You don't have to wonder what it looks like. People searching out the will of God. I'm telling the will of God has been revealed. It is written to me to do thy will, O God. I come in the volume of the book to do thy will, O God. Father has called you and I to live our lives in Christ Jesus and not in another. Not in our own. If you lose your life, you may have his. That's the context. If you lose your life, you may have his. If you hang on to your life, you will lose what you have. If you take that gift that God has given you to do the works of Jesus, and you hide it in the earth, that which you have should be taken from you and given to another. Understand, the warning's there. Many are called, but few are chosen. Understand it. The broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow, strict, strict, no compromises, no theorizing, no ideologies. It's strict. It's the Word of God and His Word alone, His way and His way alone. And few there be that find it. Let us not believe that the days of Noah should be a testimony of these days wherein only eight souls were saved. Let us not believe that there should only be 7,000 reserved who not bowed their knee to the false gods that were made to be, they made Baal, Yahweh, or Yahweh, there's two proper ways to say it. They made Baal to be Yahweh, which is the most ancient way to pronounce his name. And Asherah, his prostitute, to be his consort. And called him Yahweh and said that this is who we worship. Oh, yeah. And as a testimony against us today, Christ Jesus and what he has declared himself to be and what he's revealed himself to be, both as he is manifested in the body, as he's manifested and revealed in his word, is strict, it's strict, it's narrow, it's strict. And God's calling into heaven. He's not calling you to hardship. He's not calling you into a hell. He's not calling you into a suffering. He's calling you into a glory. He's calling you into something that is so foreign to the world that the world cannot know it. It is so opposite of the world that is separated entirely and completely even as he himself is. And he's inviting us to come out from among them, be separate, so he may be revealed and manifested to be our God and that we be manifested to be his people. God's called you and I to stand up to rise up today now I'm not going to walk in to glory and everybody looking at me like man you don't even understand the opportunities that you had and you did nothing I can hear Elijah father let me in right now let me in let me in throw me in I don't know that Paul could even have the right to say that because you know he died he's gone but Elijah, he's been alive there for over, you know, come on, 2,700 years. Let me in now. There's nobody doing it. Let me at him. Let me take hold of that thing. Let me break off that yoke. No. Come on, people. Put yourself there in Elijah's place right now. Put yourself there in the passion, the heart of the Father, as he's revealed in his word to show forth his glory and power through you, his people. Put yourself in that position. Of recognizing, I've given you this authority. All you got to do is believe. Come on, people. Come on now. Come on now. If we're going to see the same Holy Ghost conviction fall as failed in the past, we're going to have to have Holy Ghost conviction ourselves. We don't have Holy Ghost. If we can sit there and watch all of the filth that's coming right out of hell and produced by those demon-possessed producers, and we can find some kind of an association and affection towards it, Dear people, forget about it. You have no Holy Ghost conviction and you'll never communicate it. Do you hear me? I don't know this for a fact, but I got it from a good source. The, the house that Wigglesworth, the Smith Wigglesworth lived in, where he would not allow even a newspaper in his house because it was consecrated to the Lord. He didn't want anything secular. It's all God. People say, oh, that's law. Well, look at signs and wonders and miracles. Look at the manifestation of Jesus. Why are you crying law? Why are you crying foul? Look at the right. 
Satan so hates the anointing. He so hates the anointing. That his house right now, you talk about a, something so conflicted. Owned by Muslims, but they sell alcohol out of it. And so it's like a little alcoholic store for Muslims. They're not supposed to be drinking alcohol. But you know what? It's just the hypocrisy of religion. Hallelujah. How many of you enjoy a wrong spirit? Huh? Come on. Everybody likes the right spirit. You know everything that God hates? You hate it too, really? You do? If it was against, if it was working against you, you hate it. If your wife or husband was committing adultery, you hate it. Hmm? If somebody was stealing something you have, you hate it. Somebody was violating something of yours, you hate it. Oh yeah. But when it gets turned around in this self-gratification, all of a sudden the demonic realm begins to work a temptation for you to do what you would never want someone to do against you. Are you listening to me? If I was going to get a right spirit, maybe have to spank you some several severely time, severe times. Huh? Even a mare kicks her fold so she'll learn right, to act right. Are you listening to me? Come on, Papa's going to discipline you. And it's a good thing. But he doesn't want you to be a mule. Huh? That needs a, a bit. And he doesn't want you to be a fool that needs a rod. Are you with me? Huh? What does the scripture say? Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Well, the Old Testament said in wisdom, rod drives it far from it. Well, I'll tell you something, I got something better. The rod still works. Hey, quit bossing your mom around. For heaven's sakes. I got something that takes care of this. A new heart and a new spirit. Holy Ghost. The anointing. Come on, people. Don't deal with things after the flesh. Deal with everything from your children to your finances, huh? To every part of your life. After that, which God has provided by the Holy Ghost. Father's calling you. Those who've never turned your life over to Jesus, those of you who have. He's calling you to a place trusting Him alone. Come on now. Just lift your hands towards heaven. Let, let the power of the Holy Ghost come upon you. Father, we'll create a new heart. Father, we'll create a new heart and a new spirit. If you've had a new heart and a new spirit already given to you, then perhaps you believed lies. You bought into things that have brought you into, into bondage. Well, I break that thing. Christ Jesus, the same one who saved you, will save you now. He'll break off that bondage. He'll break off that yoke. He'll break off that lie. He'll break off that torment. He'll break off that compromise. He'll break off that affliction. He'll break it off of you right now. But you can't have God in your own self-help program too. In Jesus' name, right now. In Jesus' name. Let God make a champion out of you. He loves you so much. He loves you so much. He's calling you. He's dealing with you. Respond to Him. If you have strongholds in your life, if you have weaknesses in your life, if you have areas in your life that are not consecrated to God, if you've never given your life over to Christ Jesus, today, Father wants to make everything new so you can start afresh. And you can live in the freedom that He has for you. And I want to pray with you. Our Father has anointed me to pray for you and with you to see those things broken off of you. Hallelujah. If there's doubt and unbelief oppressing you, today, right now, that yoke can be broken. God wants to break it. Okay, you listen to me. Here's what the Lord says. There are those of you that are standing here right now 
and you're facing the same challenges and in the same kind of situation and circumstance that you were in a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, four years ago, and nothing's changed. He wants to change it. And you have to recognize it hasn't changed because you've not allowed him to change it. You've held on. You've held on. Today, you release. Release those things that you've held on to. Release those things that you've held on to. Come right now. You know I'm talking to you. Come right now. Come right now. I'm not looking at people. I'm, there's no condemnation here. I'm talking to people. You know exactly what I'm saying. You come now. You know exactly what I'm saying. It's true for you. But I don't want you to just come. I don't want you to just come with the same commitment of the past. It's now. You're going to release it to God. You're going to stop trusting in you and trusting in God. You're going to quit trying to manipulate your situation. Don't go anywhere. Don't go anywhere. Don't, come here. Come here. Don't go anywhere. You stay right here. I know what happened. I know what's going on. You sit down right there. Just sit right there. I know what's going on. God's in the midst of this place. And if I need to call 911, wherever Jesus is, there's go everything's going to be uncloaked. It's going to be revealed. It's going to be laid out. These are the days where you're going to quit playing games on God. I'm telling you right now, these are sacred moments. This is the moment of contest. This is the moment of those who follow God and those who do not. These are the calm moments of contest. This is the moment of decision for a nation and for a people and for a lost cultures. A lost culture. Watch God work his miracles. Men try to rush in, try to be the hand that steadies the ark. Men try to rush in to think that their expertise and their talents and their wisdom can change the matter. No, God's in the midst of us. It's about time you believe. It's about time you get yourself to where you risk your life to find out how real God is. God's more real than anybody in this place has ever believed. And he wants to make himself known. Papa wants to make himself known. You want to back off and let him move in. Then I take your hand off and let God's hand take hold of you. Father's talking to you. He loves you so much. You got to understand, Father has raised you up to be champion and Satan has been infected to fight against you. To lie against you. To lie against the truth in your life. The Spirit of the Lord is here calling you with the same call, saying, lose your life, quit holding on. Quit doing it your own way and calling it me. You listen to me. You listen to me. The self-justification that runs interference with the Word of God and the mind of God's people is a foe to have to deal with. Do you hear me? Always saying, oh, this is right and this is of God. His Word is right. His Word is of God. Not what you think. Father wants to bring you to a place where everything that you hold dear, you can thrust into his care, even as, even as Abraham did Ishmael. And he put no flesh on it, put no armor provision on it. He sent them out with bread and water for a day when he could load a whole caravan of camels of gold and silver to take care of Ishmael for his lifetime with food and provision and take them any place on the planet. He sent them out with enough bread and water for a day. He thrust them into the care of God. And it wasn't for a lack of love, for that was his firstborn son, and he loved him with all of his heart. And it prepared him to take Isaac and offer him a pawning heel called Moriah one day. And a testimony of what Father would do for us in redemption when he sent his only begotten son to be crucified at a cross called Calvary. God's calling you today. The only reason that you've been in a ditch of problems and a ditch of, of continual compromise and being overcome with things that are wrong and evil simply because you've not been willing to thrust your life into his care today. Come on now. Today. Stop fighting God. Today. 
Stop living in your own way today. Jesus Christ is here to break off the yoke upon everybody from the platform to the back row to where you are standing right now or sitting listening to me. Let's let the great salvation in Christ Jesus be made manifest in our lives. Today, decide that you're going to let the great power of that which only the cross of Calvary and the resurrection of Jesus Christ can produce in the life of a person. And you're going to be a witness to it, to all the world around you. You're going to recognize that you're not going to bring shame to him and compromise and show something that is a false witness. Today, it's a new day. Today is a new day. Today's a new day. Today the yoke is broken. Thank you, Lord.